Hey everybody, welcome. This is the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley. Every week we try to bring you stories of people who are making a difference in the world in some interesting fashion. And our Rotary Club is one of 36,000 clubs around the world. 1.2 million people in Rotary, we call ourselves Rotarians, who are trying to make the world a better place locally and globally. Now our club, the E-Club of Silicon Valley, has a specific interest in a trio of items, uh, education, entrepreneurship, and innovation. And we are excited today to bring a story that touches on at least two of those. And that is the story of Sueños. Uh, this is a program in Guatemala. Uh, and our, our guest speaker, uh, Katie Corson, is going to tell us a little bit about her path for getting to Guatemala, uh, for how she became involved in this and the kind of work that she does there. So we are very excited to have her. And with that, Katie, I hand it over to you. The mic is yours. Thank you, Rushton. Uh, I'm so excited to be here today to talk about Spanios uh, and my own path a bit. And we're going to talk about adapting education to community needs. Okay, so I want to start out talking about the community that we work with. So uh, it was nice to hear that Sandy has been to Guatemala before. Um, for a lot of folks who come to Guatemala, maybe briefly, or um, maybe have never been here, it seems that Guatemala really promotes the indigenous cultures um, that there are many of here. However, when we get a closer look, uh, there's a lot of discrimination that goes on. And specifically in the community that we work with, we are in Antigua, Guatemala, which is a town completely focused on tourism. And the population of indigenous people that is living in Antigua is mostly uh, coming to Antigua for economic opportunity, but they really find a lot of barriers to living um, a happy and productive life here because they are marginalized. They are both a racial and economic minority. Um, so this is how our work started out, focusing in on this community. Um, I came here in 2014, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about sort of the path to becoming an organization in the next slide. <laughs> but just to share a bit about our community, um, everyone that we work with at Sueños is part of this group of street vendors. About 90% of the families are Maya Quiche, so they're indigenous. Um, they are mostly as well internal migrants in Guatemala, and they come from three other rural departments. Um, they've traveled to Antigua for this economic opportunity. And then we see that there are a lot of limitations that they're experiencing when they get into education. So out of the students that we have right now, all of our students who've been in school before, who are in second to fifth grade, <laughs> Uh, have at least repeated one year or entered school one year late, 100% of them. So just briefly, uh, <laughs> we have had a long history of really adapting and adapting again to the community needs that we've seen. I uh, had a very chance and luck, lucky <laughs> uh, meeting with the families that we work with now when I moved here in 2013 and we, we started our program in 2014. Um, we originally were a dance, a dance class um, and then over time became an after school program. And then as of this year, we are operating as a school. So that road has taken us to um, this concept of community-centered education, which is what we're gonna be talking about today. And really throughout the time that we've been working together, the most important thing for us has been to provide a safe space. Um, as I mentioned, there are not a lot of spaces for indigenous people in Antigua that are accessible. And part of that is that the work that they're doing um, is not protected by the law. Technically, they are not allowed to be working as street vendors. So that presents in itself um, a big opportunity for violence. And we see a lot of violence between police or the municipal government and families. 
um, who are working as street vendors. So having a safe environment has always been number one for us. And then um, once we're in that safe environment, providing the tools for empowerment and learning. And then our vision has been focused uh, on making sure that kids are getting the most basic education. So as of just last year, we've seen our first graduates of primary school. We had five students graduate from primary school last year. And this year we're gonna have one more. And within the community, uh, about 85% of parents haven't graduated primary school and about 40% of parents have never been to school. So this is a huge deal for families. And then we have these three uh, strategic focus areas, which are literacy, critical thinking, and social and emotional learning. Okay, so this is where I'm gonna ask you guys <laughs> to participate and you can share literally anything that comes to mind, what your thoughts are about what does community-centered education sound like to you? What do you think it is? I would say that that's gotta involve people, not just in, in the learning, but in the teaching. Any other idea? Um, I would say, you know, trying to inspire people to want to learn because, you know, sometimes there's programs where it's like, oh my gosh, I can't wait to go to school tomorrow. Um, and, you know, then there's the other kids that are just like, no, not going to do it. Yes. Yeah. Any other thoughts, Rory? I think that this, I, this concept of some kids not wanting to go to school is extremely important in our community because there isn't necessarily an example in the family of parents having gone to school. And when students usually get to school in our community, if they're going into a public school, which is where most students will go if they don't come to Sueños, they're going into an environment that is 100% conducted in Spanish and it's not their first language. Their first language is Quiche, and many of them are not speaking fluently Spanish when they go to school, which can be extremely isolating and difficult. So this is actually the first element of what the five factors that we define as community-centered education, which is language inclusivity. Um, so all of the languages spoken in the community are present in the classroom. For us right now, that means that we have Spanish, we have Quiche, we also have a little bit of English, um, and if we were to, at another time, have students who speak Kachikel or another indigenous dialogue, we would also, um, dialect, we would also include that. So here we have a little example of some of the writing that they've done in Quiche. This is what <laughs> some of the Quiche words look like. And I'm going to play a very short video where you can watch a facilitator speaking to children as they read a book together. Okay, so that was just a short little clip, but you can see in the video that the kids are extremely engaged in what they're doing um, with the facilitator who's able to speak to them in their first language. And then in addition to that, they also have a teacher who is speaking to them in Spanish. Our, our classrooms all have two teachers in them. The second element of community-centered learning is examining real issues. So let me just check that you guys can see the slide. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so for us, what we see often as well in the public schools is that there is not a link between students' lives and what's happening in the classroom. So all of the learning that we do in Sueños is through projects. And here I have a couple examples and you can kind of see in the pictures some kids vaccinating each other, <laughs> uh, checking on some patients. And then there's also um, some work about discrimination that we can see in the pictures. 
Some of the examples of projects that we've had this year, for example, are how to stay safe during COVID. Why does La Llorona exist as a legend in Guatemala? So looking at the political and historical context for this scary story about La Llorona. Uh, how does my family experience healing? Looking at the difference between Western medicine and traditional Mayan practices, that's a preschool project. And then how uh, does my community experience discrimination? <coughs> Number three, we make sure that everything that students are learning can be applied in their daily lives. So if we look at some of these pictures, we can see immediately some uh, reflections of what parents do. So since parents are street vendors, we see uh, some market scenarios, some selling scenarios, uh, carrying some food on the head. Um, this third picture is um, students are filling out information about their emotions. And then the last picture, they're making a traditional Guatemalan dish with the help of their parents. Number four is representation. So we make sure that the school environment reflects the community in terms of representation, which means that we like to have community members who are both in the classroom and we have the goal of them also being on our administration. And this is really connected to the fifth element, which is decision making. So for us, it's really important that parents and community members are part of all important decisions that we make about programs. And this really helps us to align the work that we're doing with the community and make sure that uh, the work that we do is going to be effective and we're not inventing uh, strategies that really won't work uh, with the community. So I'm just briefly gonna touch on our programs. We have uh, a preschool program, an elementary program, and then we have these three support programs where parents are able to participate. We have a social support program that includes a psychologist and a social worker. And then we also have a nutrition program that gives uh, food to our students every day. And that is it. Now we can get into questions and I'm just gonna leave you guys with a little drop. <laughs> if you are interested in supporting our work right now, we have a goal of moving to our dream home. During COVID, we needed to move into a shared space um, because of everything that was going on. And we're, we're gearing up to move back into our own building. So we're, we're hoping to raise $10,000 by the end of the year to be able to do that. And here's the rest of our info as well. Wonderful, Katie. Thanks. We'll make sure that those links are also available uh, beneath the recording, uh, the video recording on our meeting page. So if you are if you are watching this as a recording on our meeting page, please do click on the link you see below. We'll get into the questions, but beforehand, want to in introduce the folks that we have on the recording. Uh, here in California, uh, we have Sandy, wave at the camera, Shags, we have Cecilia, and we have me, Rushton, me. Uh, in uh, Texas, we've got Rory, wave Rory. And Jasmine is back there somewhere, his four-legged uh, sidekick who is, who is a special friend of the team. Uh, and then in Georgia, we've got friend of the club, uh, Chanel. Good to have you with us as well. So Katie, we're gonna start with a question that, uh, that Rory asked uh, in the chat. Rory, you want me to read that or do you wanna, wanna ask it yourself? Okay, I got, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, you mentioned a little bit about discrimination and I asked, could you go into a little more detail as to what sort of sorts of discrimination are there and what's done to try and remedy them? Sure, so the families that we work with experience really very limited access to all institutions. Um, so that might mean that they go to the hospital and uh, they are not offered the correct treatment or they're not offered quality of treatment. Um, they might go to a legal institution, um, possibly to protect themselves or their family, and they will find that there uh, is no one that is speaking their language. They're not provided a translator. Um, the process may work against them, they may be encouraged to not follow through with the process um, that we've seen often. So because of those experiences, um, families are often not willing to seek out the institutions that are available. Okay, thanks. 
Uh, I believe Cecilia, you've got the next question. Right. Um, so Katie, thank you for your presentation. Um, kind of brings me back to the many times I've been in Guatemala myself. And one of the questions I have is there, which is maybe not directly germane to your program, but there are so many organizations working in Guatemala, in particular in Antigua and near the lake, um, that it, does, is yours the only one, for example, that's working with the street vendor population, or is that kind of your way of differentiating what you're doing there? Yeah, so you're correct. There are tons of organizations working here, especially in Antigua. Um, that's one of the elements that sets us apart. But the other thing is that we're the only school that offers the Quiche language, not only in Antigua, but in Zacatepeques. So the like the state, the department that we're in is not a region that uh, has a high population of families that speak Quiche. So we're the only school that's offering this right now. Uh, and, all, and the vendors tend to be Quiche speaking, yeah. right? Uh, okay, thank you. Sure. Cool. Chanel, why don't you unmute and ask your question next? Katie, thank you so much for your presentation. It's been definitely informative and educational. So I just wanted to ask you, what is the average weekly income for the street vendors? Yeah, are they surviving? That's a great question. Families are usually uh, really going day by day. So some families will make a couple of dollars a day um, and then are they making it? It's difficult. It's very difficult. <laughs> Got it. Thank you, Katie. Uh, Sandy, you have a question. Um, yes. Um, so how many kids are at your school and how do you recruit, um, you know, other kids to come and participate? And then actually have another part of the question is, do you get any money from the government or anyone else? Or are you just kind of on your own? Okay, so we currently have 28 students at the school and uh, at different points in time, we've had different amounts of students, but over time, we've actually narrowed it down to try and focus in more on um, working more deeply with each family. And the way that we recruit students has actually always been by word of mouth. Um, and that's gonna be continued uh, into the future. <laughs> Um, and in terms of funding, we don't get any government funding. We're funded completely by individual donors. Most of our donors are in Philadelphia, um, and that's where I'm from. And then we also have some other donors in the United States. Got it. So Katie, what you started this, this program as, as a dance program, and, and I'd love to hear more about how like the dance program morphed into the school and, and some of the other programs that you've got going as well. Sure. Yeah. So it was actually a friend of mine who brought me into this community, um, a friend who is Guatemalan and had kind of, you know, grown up alongside these families and had some friendships within the community. Um, and the, the idea when he brought me in was to just find volunteers and kind of take advantage of their skills. So at that point in time, I just moved to Guatemala. My skill set was in salsa dance. Uh, <laughs> so we would have these dance classes with Latin rhythms out in the park, in the central park of Antigua, um, where these families were working. And it was a really great way for me to meet a lot of the kids in the families. It was very noticeable. <laughs> um, but so we did that for two years. And during that time, we came to know a lot more about the community. And it was clear that education was a really important need. We were seeing, you know, some of the kids that were in our programs weren't going to school. They were dropping out maybe after second or third grade. Um, so that was when we made the transition. And originally we were focusing on after school. And then because of COVID last year, 95% of our students didn't have interaction with the teacher. Uh, so that was how we decided to become a more formal school this year. Chanel asks uh, a question as well. Chanel, go ahead and, and unmute and ask that one. Okay, that's definitely informative. How many languages are spoken in the school and how did you become, um, I guess more uh, bilingual to prepare for the school? 
Sure. So the main languages that are spoken in the school are Quiche, which is a Mayan language in Spanish. And we also now have a little bit of English, um, which is a requirement for the formal school. Um, how did I become bilingual? So I'll go ahead and say I don't speak Quiche. <laughs> I am learning alongside some of our staff. And the reason that we're able to be a bilingual school is that in addition to having a trained teacher in the classroom, we also have a community member who's responsible for admin of Quiche. So um, we, it's very difficult in our community to find the profile of people who are both Quiche and have studied education, but we've found this perfect pairing of having um, a teacher who has studied and speaks Spanish alongside a community member who speaks Quiche and is uh, learning about education. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. I'm thinking about the things that the students learn in the school. Uh, you, you, know, you mentioned that there were some activities built around the kinds of things they experience as street vendors. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about those, those educational activities that they do? Sure, so uh, we come from an interdisciplinary approach. So one example of something that we might be looking at is a math problem related to selling. So something that we found when students were in public school is that they would get awful grades in math, and then we would see them in their jobs doing incredible mental math. <laughs> um, so we're looking to make that connection, right? So a math problem in our school could be something like uh, someone is, is purchasing like 20 quetzales of scarves, how, how many dollars will they give you? How much change will you get back? Um, and our students are excellent at those types of mental math skills. So translating them then onto the paper is what we're working on. And do I remember right that you, from, from your intro, that you actually do some consulting with the government related to math education? Right? Yeah, so before I came full-time at Sueños, I was working um, doing a lot of teacher trainings. Um, and some of that was with an organization called Teachers to Teachers, which also made me feel very passionate about seeing math in context um, and I actually uh, worked with that program for four years and trained a group of teachers throughout that time. One of them who is on our staff now. <laughs> so we have um, some really wonderful connections there. And final question before we start winding things down, a little bit about, uh, about you know, how you've connected with with other people who support you. So, so the folks uh, in Philadelphia, the other parts of the United States, what, what, are, what are some of the ways that, that they have learned about your, your project and said, hey, we wanna get involved? Yeah, I think it's interesting. Um, there are actually a, a number of people in the US who have connections to Guatemala and especially because of everything that's been going on with immigration, I think more people have have been interested in looking to connect and support local organizations that are helping to, to keep people in um, uh, a good life here without having to, to migrate. Um, so most of our community, as I said, is in Philadelphia and um, many friends and family um, and then we also have kind of a wonderful community of families with adopted children from Guatemala there, um, which I think is a really nice connection. And another nice connection that we have is actually to the schools where I studied. So our, um, our board president was my teacher <laughs> in both middle and high school. So um, she has really helped me to, to reconnect with the places that I went to school. And she has also her own sort of education focused network in Philadelphia that has helped to support us. All right, well, tapping connections is the first way to get, get momentum, that's for sure. So what we'll do is we'll wind down and then at the end, I'll hand it back to you for a final word as, as we like to do. Uh, so all of you who've been watching this recording, thank you for joining us this week. Uh, it, is, it is our pleasure to be able to share these stories of people doing good work in all sorts of different places and in order to address all sorts of different needs. 
And, and if you have been joining us and you are a Rotarian and you are looking to make up a missed uh, meeting of your own, then feel free to just let us know you were here. There is an attendance place and all you need to do is put in your name and your email address and that will generate an email you can pass along to your club secretary to make up the miss. Uh, if you are visiting and you wanna learn about, uh, about when we do these recordings because you'd like to talk to the really cool speakers that, that we meet as a part of this uh, programs effort as a part of the e-club of Silicon Valley, then let us, uh, let us know as well. And we are very happy uh, for you to put that in the, the attendance piece, let us know, uh, so that we can get you on our friends of the e-club of Silicon Valley mailing list. Finally, uh, before you leave, members and guests, at the very bottom of the page, you're going to see our discuss section, D-I-S-Q-U-S. It's our forum. It's a chance for you to, to give impressions about the things you learned in this program or in other elements of our meeting, the yeah, the learn something new section, the inspirational video section, the messages that, that we get from our members who leave happy dollars. Rory, always a good, good member of the team on that front, right? And, and engage in those conversations. It's one of the ways that in an asynchronous online club, we have the chance to, to build our community. With that, we will do what we always like to do, which is to pass it back to our speaker for the final word. So Katie, what would you like people to walk away with squarely in their heads? Well, thanks so much for having me and also for your wonderful questions. I'll leave you guys with the question of where do you think or what do you think community centered education would look like in your communities where you are or where you're invested in education. Wonderful. Everyone, we will see you next week.